Is it just me or is it warm in here? It is warm in here. Good, I'm glad we're all suffering together. <laughs> I want to share with you uh, just briefly this message is actually for our graduates and yet it speaks very plainly to us as well. Uh, in doing my studies for discipleship, I came across an article. This article was by Constantine Campbell. And in it, he discusses advice for young men. Oh, I'm sorry. Children 12 and under are dismissed. Please go. I'm sorry. I was thrown. So I'm going to share this speaking specifically to Caleb, to Nathan. But I want you all to pay attention to hear because this advice, th these instructions apply to us all. Number one, find your identity in Christ. Let your identity rest in Christ. The world has broad brushed finding yourself. But without, your, without Christ, yourself is lost. Scripture tells us that you must consider yourselves dead to sin, to this world, to yourself. And then be made alive in Christ. He tells us that when we come, we come to the cross. We come to the place of death. We give up our lives. We give up our rights. We give up our privileges. To embrace what He has for us. And He takes us through the cross. Luke tells us that we must bear this cross daily. And yet Jesus tells us that we are to cast our cares on Him, to take, take our burdens and lay them at His feet, that we are to take His yoke upon us because it's easy and it's light. So He does all the heavy lifting. I want you two young men to know how deeply loved of God you are. You both have family. You both have grown up in this church. We know that you are loved by your family, but the love of God so far supersedes that. Not just because of the cross, but because after the cross, after His Son resurrected and ascended to heaven, He sent His Holy Spirit to draw you to Him. And He has sealed you with His Holy Spirit unto Himself. You are His. Scripture says you are co-heirs with Christ. That now, because of God's Spirit living in you, you have the right to call Him Abba Father. You are one of the select that God has chosen. Find your identity in Christ. Root yourself in Him. The paths you walk will take you many places, many experiences, many encounters. Each of these will in some way shape you. But at your core, at your root, at your identity, who you are, let Christ reside. Have a plan to grow in maturity. Don't just expect that as you get older, you will grow up. No, you just grow older. They say that bad experience and bad judgment brings wisdom. 
I disagree. Any fool can learn that fire is hot by putting their hand in it. But it takes a wise man to learn from somebody else. It takes a wise man to know, hey, don't touch the fire because it's hot. Have a plan. Look to those around you that you admire, that you esteem in the faith. Set them as an example before you. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. See, that brings me to my next point. I'm going to kind of share these two together. Friendships. Set yourself in a safe place with your friends. I would encourage you, seek out two, three men, men of God, We reflect those whom we dwell with, those whom we spend the most time with. They rub on us, we rub on them. And I would encourage you, find a close friend that is stout in his faith, that is unmoved in his faith. Someone that you can share with, that you can be open and honest with, that you can share your struggles I want to caution you. Put away the sins of your youth. Put them away. Work on them right now. Don't expect that as you age they will just go away. Because all too often we just become firmly more entrenched in those sins. Have a friend that will hold you to account. Somebody that will have the fortitude to confront you and tell you you're wrong. You're in error. You're in sin. And they will love you enough to walk through the restoration process with you. And then be that friend for them. Be that friend that is there not just in the good times when things are going well, but that friend that is there when things are hard, when life is tough. Be that friend that will willingly go to them and confront them when they are in sin. Have enough love for them that you would point them back to safety. Another piece of advice I would share with you. Don't look for the perfect woman to marry. She doesn't exist. And if she did, you would mess her up by marrying her. <laughs> there is no such thing as a perfect woman. When people get married, you picture two rough pieces of wood, gnarly. And when they come together, they start to rub and there's friction. <coughs> and that rubbing together begins to soften the places out, begins to smooth out. And if you hold fast and if you hold true, it won't take long before it becomes one beautiful piece of wood. And I want to share with you Instead of looking for that perfect woman to marry, start working on your relationship with Christ. That when you marry, you can deal with your spouse in love and grace. That you can treat her as Christ has treated the church. That you can intercede on her behalf before the Father. That you can be that firm place for her. <coughs> Scripture says that husbands are Christ, the Christ figure to their wives, as the wives are the church figure. And I want to share with you, it says that you are to lay down your life for your wife, 
Yeah, we like to think of that as diving in front of the bullet. But I want to tell you, it's in the day in and the day out. It's in the little things. It's in sacrificing your will, your desires, to be that man of God for her that she needs. And by extension, to be that man of God that your children will need. Set your hearts before God. Allow Him to mold you, to shape you. That you might best bless your future wife. I would like you to understand that in this life you will need strength. But it's not the strength that is braggadocious, that's, that's a bragger, that is self-exalting. It is the kind of strength that our Savior had. It's that strength that allowed Himself to subject Himself to the, the, the crazy insanity of a fallen world. It's that kind of strength that when He could call ten legions of angels, he willingly laid down his life. It's that strength that after he had spent the entire day and most of the evening ministering to the needs of the sick, he sneaks off by himself to get along with God. You need to learn to be meek. We so confuse meek in our language. We, we assume that meek equals weak. That's a, that's a lie. That's a mistake. Meek is strength control. Strength with purpose. It does not seek to exalt itself. Scripture prompts us over and over that we need to be humble because God of resists the proud. And yet if you humble yourself, God has said that He will lift you up. So you have before you a choice. You can choose to be exalted by man, which is momentary, which lasts for a breath, for an instant. Or you can choose to be exalted by the Almighty God in eternity. That on that day when you stand before Him, He might say, Well done. You're entering into a phase in our, our culture where you're beginning to move into your own, to become the head of your own house. I would encourage you as the dynamic of your family relationship changes, that you would accept the change, that you would embrace the change, that you would allow God to make you a unique you, that you would open your heart, that you would open your ears, that you would be willing to go where God sends you, that when God calls, you would say, here am I. Lord, send me. And I would challenge this church as you go throughout your busy life that you would remember these young men, that you would intercede on their behalf, that you would ask our Father to lead them, to strengthen them, to guide them, to use them to accomplish His purposes whatever they would be. That you would be there for them when they have need, whether you know it or not. That's the way a body works. That's the way a body functions. That's how God has called us to be. So church, I've spoken to these two young men I'm sharing with you, we have got to get rooted in Christ. 
this world has laid so many traps and snares for us. We think we have it good in America, but I tell you truly, we have a gilded cage. <coughs> Our traps are feather pillows and good food. A nice, warm, secure house. Bills that are paid. And I tell you truly, that oftentimes the devil will lull us to sleep with a lullaby. And we think we're okay when truly we are asleep. So I would challenge you this morning, just as I've challenged these young men, get your identity rooted in Christ. Set a plan for maturity. Don't just expect that it will happen. Move, act on it. Cause it to happen. Work with God to allow it to happen. Be careful in your friendships. The Word tells us in the book of James, chapter 4, that friendship with the world is enmity toward God. You have to pick your friends wisely. Be meek. Be meek. Be strong. Absolutely. Have strength. But have strength tempered with the mercy, the goodness of our Father that allows your heart to beat in sympathy with those that are hurting and to rejoice with those who are rejoicing. Because that's what our Father does. Amen. Amen. Father, we bless You this morning and I thank You for these young men. Father, for the privilege of being able to watch them, to see them grow. Father, to in some part experience that growing. And Father, we commit them into Your care. We ask, Lord God, even as we have commissioned them that, Father, we would embrace what You have called us to do. Father God, that we would be sensitive to the moving of Your Spirit, that we would be faithful in the things that You have called us to, that we would be bold in the proclamation of Your salvation. Father, that we would not be a people intimidated by the discomfort, dissatisfaction, or enmity of the world. You have told us that if they hate You, they will hate us. Father, let us be moved by love. The love that we have learned from You. Father, to put Your Word forth. That we would speak it with boldness, with clarity. But Father, undergird it always with love. We bless You this morning, Father. And we honor You in Jesus' name. Amen.